Hello, hello. Uh, my name is Harry Yef. Uh, I'm also known as Reaps One and sometimes Reaps 100. Uh, confusing, I know. My whole world is the human voice. I was born into a neurodivergent home. Uh, I am diagnosed ADD and dyslexic. And the environment, albeit chaotic, um, led me into a journey of voice. Voice at the very beginning of my life, well, near the beginning, uh, was my temple. And the situation I was in suggested there were a certain set of opportunities and a set of outcomes. And it's through my journey into voice, in pushing it to its absolute limit, in literal technique and evolving into the stunning privilege of traveling around the world and meeting leading thinkers, engineers, coders, experienced designers, academics around voice, led me to this central concept that A, uh, the voice is an incredible method for exploring technology in the world around us. It has a fundamental role in not only our sense of identity, but all of our relationships. And more and more, the voice is becoming a key method for how we interface with all things, a conduit of day-to-day uh, -day experience, ambient technologies. So I've effectively been a voice collector over the past uh, five years, um, understanding not only my voice, but what are the most precious voices on earth? How do you even answer that question? So what I'm here to really talk about is my most recent project with my collaborator, Trung Bao, which is Voice Gems, the 1000 year archive. I've been designing generative systems for around 10 years that use the voice as a central key uh, to visualize data. So all of our voices have this fingerprint-like information that can be vast and complex. Any conversation you have is one of the most complex acts in all of nature, but I'm particularly interested in non-linguistic. It's a 200,000 particle system uh, that reveals these key features as a method to turn a voice, something that is normally like smoke, into an object. Um, we primarily started in the digital realm, but we're also moving, moving into the physical, which I'll get to a little bit later. More concept on voice. Everyone is familiar with this term flow state. Um, the technical term being expert behavior, skills that we learn where there is no stammering of concept, skills that are rehearsed so much that our internal systems believe we need them to survive. The most common flow state and expert behavior on earth is speech. So we are designed to be masterful with our voices. Our voices are a fundamental part of everything. Therefore, moving beyond my own voice, this is why I became particularly interested in how far can a voice go and what voices should we keep. I also believe in the explosive experiential nature of knowledge. I think that's an absolute desperate need uh, when it comes to opening someone's mind. So my main role is also thinking about, well, how can we find these cross-modal ways of sharing important ideas? And where did my journey begin with experimenting laterally with ideas of preservation? So in 2018, uh, I went to a nuclear reactor in Sweden, um, which is no longer active. And I met an incredible human being called Martina from the Sister Moon Project. And it was there that I composed and wrote a piece of music which was all vocal, which was actually bounced off of the moon. The thing that I found most interesting is the radio waves that did not reflect back to Earth are still traveling in the universe at the speed of light. And I think one difficulty we have day to day is this awful immediacy of everything. And I think we're losing time literacy. I think it's a very hard thing for people to perceive is this idea, well, when is something going to be kept for longer? And when we think of technology, I think there is this digital immediacy, there's this coldness. But what I'm finding is with digital, with new experiences, there are these very fascinating new phenomena that are appearing when it comes to how we create our legacy. So in one context, we think of storage, we think of keeping things. For many others, we think of legacy. Many of the message, messages you send will be a part of your legacy. So as artists, how do we actually move between language? How do we find the poetry and the romanticism in new technologies? One other lateral way that I experimented with preservation uh, is my extensive work with machine learning and AI and voice. Um, so the clip you're about to hear, you might recognize. She sees 
So those are some tips right there. The next uh, is the main. Um, they um, are with the nice in our form. So this is and so this is just, uh, and them we live in their life. So so that so that very very bizarre clip. Um, is a generative version of my voice uh, using sample RNN, a collaboration with CJ Carr. And I speculate more and more these vast data sets of interactions that we create, whether it's intentional, more and more the artist is exploring the art of the data set. People will generate this idea of the second self. There will be the ability to create extensions of the self uh, which live or are perceived much longer than our lifespans. So how does your data, how do your, your choices come together? How are they gonna be represented? So there are phraseologies in voice that are happening in that clip, as bizarre it may be, that I have never said. So something that is normally a one-off, like a snowflake or a fingerprint, there are these alternative ways that will become more and more common that people are starting to interact with their data and keep things. So returning to voice gems, myself and Trung Bao became fascinated. Well, what's a manifesto of preservation? If we're going to keep voices for 1,000 years, which voices and, and why? And there's a simple premise that has not changed since the beginning of the project. We're particularly interested in unique, remarkable, but also vulnerable voices. And it was with that manifesto we started to reach out to a collection of varied human beings. And the response for us was shocking. This idea of asking individuals, send us, give us a message that we will generatively produce and keep an object from. Um, and we want you to consider that question. So when we reached out, uh, today we have figures like Ai Weiwei, which is this piece, uh, Jane Goodall, Reggie Watts, Philippe Pantone, Lily Cole, uh, and the list grows. But as I mentioned, we're particularly interested in the art of vulnerable voices. So when you take something that is uh, expected to be perceived in a certain way, so I mentioned the voice is like smoke, it's an ephemeral thing. When you present it as an object, there is a brand new relationship. You're able to tell stories in new ways. And also once you have an object, it can move through the world and be interacted with. There are opportunities in ownership and ceremony, which I think are deeply fascinating. So, this is a series of five pieces we did with Ben Mirren, who's a National Geographic explorer. And we were particularly interested in starting to curate a set of critically endangered voices. So the system picks up on some very key features. Resonance, harmonics, and the transience of how you speak. So as you're communicating the shape of the attack and release of the sounds that you make. If we use the same audio twice, you end up with the exact same piece. So the aim is to have a pure data visualization, something that is a literal translation, but of course is poetic and has this uh, storytelling and ceremonial nature to it. As we started to expand and experiment, something very strange happened. When we started to get our first bits of global press and more attention came to the project, we started to receive hundreds of emails and messages from people that wanted to preserve moments that we would normally see as very small. It could be a voice note or a conversation with a daughter or a son, it could be a loved one that is not here anymore. And that idea of non-tech native people wanting somewhere to serve and place all of this precious media. And when I say precious media, it's digital content that as we progress in society, it's not a question of digital anymore. These are memories. And I personally lost my father four months ago. And it's with a a context like that, you realize that these small things that you sometimes uh, are not grateful for at the time become vastly important. So that aspect of the project became a really interesting concept of digital ceremony. 
And I would love for you to listen to this very simple interaction and piece. Tell me your name. Katie. What's your name? Percy. Where did you go <laughs> today? Um, where did you? You went to the zoo? Yeah. You went in the Wawa? Yeah. What, what animals did you see? A uh, penguin. A penguin? Yeah. Such a tiny, small moment, um, very clearly a conversation between a father and a daughter. We isolated uh, the tiny voice of the daughter and used that to generate the piece. And more and more, there are questions on what is the future of tradition? How will digital have a spiritual quality? And the kinds of requests that we're receiving now, I think really highlight, highlights the, the real need for the curiosity of new digital ceremony. And many of the traditions that are profoundly important and uh, integral parts of culture, there are questions arising, well, how will they evolve? And if you look retrospectively, they have changed massively. There are huge shifts. So to keep something is a very, very difficult question, but we're particularly interested in what we're calling full spectrum cross-modal preservation. The very first decentralized system was storytelling. It was voice. The preservation of culture came through song and messages. And we sometimes forget that sharing things and what's present in deep, check, um, deep technologies like the deep parts of blockchain preservation and decentralized systems are not inherently alien. They are important things that have been present in culture for a very, very long time. And I think that's particularly exciting. So from use of blockchain as a medium of preservation all the way through to memification. And what I mean by that is many of the things that we say and the ideas that we share are hugely important in terms of our legacy and our memory. And I think sometimes we're so focused on the technology that we forget that word of mouth is still a profoundly uh, important aspect of preservation and memory. So in keeping with full spectrum, of course, we wanted to move into physical expressions of the voice gems, which connect with the digital expression. So what we did uh, with Ra School in Manchester, which is the laboratory, is 3D print one of the underlying structures. This piece was generated by laughter between two lovers, which was one of the very first pieces. And funnily enough, uh, I did a performance for Wired uh, a number of years ago, and it was at that piece where I generated a series of voice-generated uh, sculptures. Someone approached me, and they said, I want to propose to my partner. And I, I have this recording of us laughing together. I would love to explore uh, a replacement to a physical gemstone. So this piece, we actually uh, grew aluminum mineral onto the 3D print, and it's the world's first voice-generated crystalline form. And as we said, as much as there is this new opportunity for digital ceremony, there are uh, wonderful ways for people to contribute data and create stunning artworks. And I think having things that live in multiple realities is key to preservation. So how can we be explosive and poetic and stunning across all aspects of modern reality? A month ago, we selected a set of voice gems, uh, and we actually showed them at a space very near here at W1, um, where we had 7,000 individuals come and listen to these ceremonial pieces. So as a part of full spectrum expression, I think moving beyond traditional mediums, not only can we produce these stunning world-class digital works, physical pieces, large-scale experiential communication, is, for me, a huge part of the work. Uh, and we're very, very proud to be able to explore the cutting edge of experience design around voice. So the most key point to approaching projects like this laterally, because I acknowledge this isn't a linear way of uh, approaching preservation, we have an epidemic of not listening. Bias is at an all-time high. And this idea of narratives of fear, how can we use awe, experience, and wonder 
to create narratives of hope. I believe in this idea of three seconds of change and traditional media is really struggling to move people out of their biases. So my focus is primarily on generating narratives of hope around new technologies. And I encourage all of you to explore your voices more because it is the final frontier and it is not charted yet. Uh, I am Harry F. Thank you very much.